Hello, here I am. So yeah, we're we're finishing up a long week for everyone. I'm sure your heads are filled with uh, <laughs> lots of information. So I'm going to fill it with some more. But um, this is going to be about about media criticism, being a press critic, and what the field is, and what it looks like, and and the various functions of it. And um, I've been a press critic since 2007. Um, I came to the business after uh, 25 years as a reporter and uh, 10 years as a business reporter. Um, and I'm essentially a, a critic of business and financial news. That's my job. I mean, that was the point of the section I run. And the section I run is devoted specifically to the financial press, business press, Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Fortune. Uh, the idea being that um, um, that um, um, you needed some special expertise, I suppose, to to take on articles that um, have to do with technical subjects like business and finance. But, you know, in the course of doing that, it's been six years already. I, uh, I began to think about media in general, and, um, and now I get to think about in, in, in both the problems and the merits of, of, uh, of, of journalism and media and um, the underlying structure of it, which we talked about today. Like, there's, this is the structure of, of Ukraine media. I think we, we mapped it out. And uh, now I get to think about um, criticizing the critics. So looking at the idea of press criticism, what's, it, what's the meaning of it and what, what it is. Let's just start at the beginning and, and keep it pretty basic, OK? Um, I guess there are um, a handful of uh, things that media critics are supposed to do. And um, I want you to, I've been told, to, been pointed to a couple of sites in Ukraine where, you know, you, you, people rely on them for media criticism. And I, wanna, I want you to think about it. Apparently there are uh, media sapiens and what was the other one that you pointed it out to me? Yeah. Right. That's the main one, right? Okay. And maybe you'll, because uh, I, I want to see if um, what you mean when you think of as media critic sites, like what is that? What do they do? And see how that matches up with it. Okay. Uh, uh, media reporting. Media reporting is really being a news reporter about the media business like you're a reporter about anything. So, um, you know, the head of Kiev Post resigns, that's a story. Somebody covers it, right? It's a, it's a beat, like everything else. So um, that's one form of, uh, uh, of, of, of media writing, and it's not, essentially, it's not necessarily criticism, but it certainly contains modes of analysis and stuff like that. For instance, if... Um, you know, the New York Times makes news by um, 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 putting up a, a paywall in front of its site. That would be um, reported by other media outlets. Um, Forbes and Fortune and everyone else might write about them. So I assume that as business reporters on business desks that you would cover the media like any other business, right? Okay. And and that's and is that and does does every does every um, paper have a media reporter or somebody who covers the news? Okay. Say for instance, um, the ownership of the Kiev Post changes hands. Does is that news? Does ever does that is that and everyone writes about it? Okay, so that's you know one function, and that's that's. That's pretty basic, but somebody has to keep an eye on media, just like the media keeps an eye on everything else, right? So 
it's kind of usually it's sometimes problematic because where I work in New York, um, you know, everyone works in media, and when you're covering media, um, often you'll find reporters are very careful because <clears throat> they may write something critical or report about something bad that happened at Fortune or Forbes or the New York Times. But in the back of their minds, everyone's wondering whether they want to work there at some point. So there's always this problem. There's a particular problem, and I think it, the media bees have this particular tension. For instance, if you're covering oil and gas, or um, or government or whatever, I mean, you're covering it, be, you know, as a reporter, and you're not really necessarily thinking about working there. Whereas if you're covering media, typically everyone sort of is worried about offending someone that may eventually hire. So I assume, I wonder if that's actually, does that, does that describe the situation here? I and mean, people worry about their careers everywhere. And I, I want to say that in Media Beat, is, it has a special particular problems. Media covering media. Does, does that make sense? Does that, does that ring true here? Okay. So that's one area of inquiry. The other um, piece is, and we're going to get through to, to examples, is like the, the academics. And I want you to think about um, whether you have literally university scholars. People have PhDs and you know real uh, serious um, scholars who study uh, media from sociological and communications theory point of view. And these are important aspects of media uh, studies, media criticism. It's it, it's it's important for everyone to be familiar with them. When I was a working reporter, I didn't know that there was a whole field of academics who were writing volumes and volumes of scholarly work about what I did. Most of it was not very useful, but some of it was incredibly valuable. It's this meta picture of where media fits into the society. I mean, you know, that's another piece. Third piece I call is future of news thinkers. We'll, we'll go th through these a bit more. But these are all people now trying to figure out like how the technological change, we just talked about a little bit this, this morning, how technological change is going to um, affect the news. Um, and we'll talk about those guys. Then uh, in the U.S. is very um, common, and I don't know if it's common here, but as I said this morning, right, um, the media in um, the U.S. has often uh, been accused of <clears throat> secretly carrying out the agenda of the left wing of the U U.S. public, Democrats or liberals. Liberals became a dirty word. Liberal is <clears throat> means left to center, you know, reformist or whatever. You might be for higher minimum wages or worker safety, uh, regulation of finance, you're a liberal. And um, often those issues, as I say, uh, correspond to um, th things that um, journalists might write about. Sometimes, often journalists write about, hey, the you know, worker safety is an issue at this factory. Is that a journalistic enterprise or is that, is that some sort of political exercise? And <clears throat> I would argue, if it's done correctly, of course it's a journalistic thing, and what, what the political implications are is not the journalist's business. But like I said, um, a lot of times um, in the U.S. over the last 30 years, criticism of media has centered, has one major area of criticism of U.S. media has become, been by right-wing people, right-wing conservative people, some of them in good faith, others of them uh, um, uh, acting as um, proxies for big corporate interests, will... Um, um, will criticize media as you're not doing your job in good faith. You say that you're out gathering facts objectively without, um, without any particular agenda, which is what journalists are really supposed to do. But we know, this is what the conservatives say, we know what you're doing really is secretly helping the left. And that's been very a difficult issue for media, as I said, in the U.S. media, because... Uh, and so anyway, the, my point here is that there's a whole platoon of, uh, of, of mostly websites, 
devoted entirely to reading the New York Times and the Washington Post and other papers as for, for, um, uh, for um, uh, incidents of alleged bias sneaking, sneaking its way into the news. Um, many of you know U.S. press traditions, and I think it's not so different here, I th is that reporters are supposed to be objective gatherers of facts. We go out into the world, we try and find out what's the most important thing. If something's wrong, we report it. It doesn't matter who it hurts, who's in power, what, whatever. That's, what, that's the ideal, right? And so we, we hold ourselves out at that, and, and, and the right wing often thinks of that as a... Um, as a, uh, a, a, a mask of objectivity to hide a political agenda. I would say also, there's a whole segment on the left that also accuses of media of uh, <clears throat> essentially um, being uh, there uh, to reinforce the status quo. Like what, what the media does is uh, basically echo the voices of power. It does shuts out um, uh, dissonant views. And uh, as an effect, all you hear from in the media is, um, is uh, pro uh, pronouncements from government, uh, uh, perspectives from big banks and big companies, and the rest of the world is crowded out. So there's a left-wing critique as well. And there's a, and, and that's a, that's a, a, I guess in the U.S. it's a category of criticism. I don't know if it exists here. And I don't know. And here, you'll, maybe you'll tell me, but here, um, in, in, in um, obviously in other countries, Europe, it's much more common for newspapers and outlets to be associated, I mean, almost formally with political parties, correct? Is that true here? Okay. So there's no um, disguising... Um, that some of these are connected to parties and that their orientation is toward furthering their political agenda, correct? Yeah, I may be speaking a little too fast. I, I, I'm just saying here, some of these papers are explicitly associated with political parties, right? Okay. Can you name one in the party? Did I not make myself clear? Opposition versus power. Good. Good. Got it. Uh, I, are, are, are politics here oriented as they are elsewhere between left and right? Okay. Ins and outs, right? Ins and outs. People who are in power and people who are out. Is that right? More or less? Okay. Okay. So, in the U.S., things are a lot, a little bit more complicated. But we are highly polarized between the left and right, as you know. And there's a whole platoon of people who are out to police, uh, press for evidence of um, bias, political bias. Okay. And then here is where we get to like the where the rubber meets the road. I think this is what um, I call the sort of pure media criticism. Um, we have two big areas that we look at. One is ethics. Who's being paid by who? Who's got a conflict of interest? Who's not disclosing 
some problem in either their sourcing or their subject or something. Um, like, I don't know much about Ukraine, but I'm getting a sense that this is a big issue here. Right? Um, the ethics uh, are, I mean, basically what, um, what readers, uh, a kind of a minimum standard that readers should expect anywhere, and whatever the, whatever the context, whatever the culture, is that um, if there's a financial relationship between a reporter and the subject, that's probably a bad idea. But if there is, it ought to be disclosed. I mean, that's basically a, a it's sort of a prerequisite for any kind of independent and professional media. I just throw that out there. I don't want you to sort of think about that because I, we need to. I want to. I want to know the the extent to which that's that's an issue. And the other uh, last piece I'll talk about is content analysis. And I think this is kind of important because um, it's it's the hardest to do, but um, content analysis is literally analyzing the content that whatever the news organizations happen to be producing. So you have to read the stuff for whatever whatever issue you're looking at, and I, I've done a couple, and um, and it's very labor intensive. But the reason I think it's important is, of course, that um, what we call content is uh, really uh, the only thing that the public ever sees. Like the public doesn't know what happens within the newsroom. It, it doesn't know what's going on behind the scenes. All it knows is what you've put in the paper, right? So from a critical point of view, somebody needs to, and it's actually done quite rarely, somebody needs to go in and figure out what is the public seeing? What, what, what are these news outlets producing. So that's sort of the basic areas. And in fact, I'm going to stop here for a second. And, and oh, well, let me just kind of go over who's, who's who. So in the US, we have media reporters. Don't worry about the names. They're people you don't care about. But David Carr, Brian Stetler, uh, Jeff Berkovici, et cetera. These people are beat reporters. They work for the New York Times. They work for Forbes. They work for other. Um, and they're beat reports, and they cover each other. <laughs> so Brian David Carr is a prominent New York Times beat reporter. He writes about News Corp, M Murdoch's paper. And when News Corp has a scandal in, in the UK, when they're hacking phones or when they're caught, um, um, they're caught, caught bribing police or politicians, um, somebody's got to cover it, and, and this is the crew that does. And, uh, and like I said, there's always, it's a little incestuous because um, either, you know, if Carr or these people are nice to News Corp, people would say, well, you're just, you're just looking for a, getting a job there at some point. If they're harsh on News Corp, News Corp says the only reason you're doing that is because you're a competitor and you're trying to hurt us financially to better yourself. You're using your journal. So that's a very, I, I submit to you that's a very tricky position to be a, a good media reporter. And one of the things that I think that if you ever want to be a critic, you have to sort of give up the idea of ever working in the field. Again, because all you're going to do is essentially you're if you're going to be tr kind of true to your job, you're going to be offending somebody most of the time. Here are the academics that <clears throat> are important in, in the U.S. Um, a guy named Paul Starr, he's a historian. He wrote like about the post office. Post office was very important because it was its subsidies allowed newspapers to be delivered cheaply and allowed the allowed the uh, the industry to to flourish. I mean, there's ways of a guy named Herbert Gans of Columbia. It's a really interesting thing. In the 70s, he went and spent a year in newsrooms at the New York Times and, and Newsweek and at, at uh, one of the CB CBS, I think, ethnography. He did what's known as an ethnography, a sociologist. 
do this. And then what they did is they basically try, okay, it's like they go into a village in Tajikistan or something, and they're trying to figure out how the system works, how the village works, or how the municipal, here they try to figure out how the news works. And he wrote a book called Deciding What's News. And it's a really interesting thing, like, because people assume that news is some thing that grows organically, but of course it's decisions made by people, and he did a sociological analysis. Um, he actually came up with this idea that at the time, it was the beginning of the period when the press was being accused of a liberal bias. And he said, no, actually, it's not true. Um, there's, it's not, news, the news culture isn't political. It's its own culture. It's its own thing. It has its own identity and its own mores, own ways of thinking. And essentially, it's reformist in nature. What it's trying to do is reform things. And that's, uh, I think that's, uh, that was an interesting and important observation. But the point I'm making to you is, here's a guy who spent his whole life, he's a brilliant guy, and a lot of these guys are, these guys are I'm big admirers. These are not, these are really big thinkers. Like, I'm, and these guys are, but they spent their whole careers trying to figure out where the media fits into. Question I have for you, now that we're sort of halfway through this, is is there anybody in Ukraine that even that you're familiar with that big thinkers. big thinkers, yeah. Now, fact is, I didn't know about these guys for the entire career. I time I was working as a reporter, I just was working, and I did my job. And meanwhile, I'm being studied, you know, I am, but my field is being studied by, by, these, uh, by these great scholars, but I only learned about them when I was able to become a critic. I just wondered if you are familiar with anybody who is the big thinker about media in Ukraine. Okay, here we have the technologists. We spoke a little bit about them already, but and they're names you don't need to worry about. I just throw them out there because they, I just want you to know there are names and there are books about um, the future of news and it's being discussed in earnest in, in our country. And I don't know if this kind of debate is going on here. But basically, these books, here comes everybody. What would Google do? One's called We the Media. We the Media. And it's about... Uh, the idea that everyone, like I said this morning, everyone will be a reporter. Everyone will participate in the news. These people are, uh, like I said, mostly um, products of, of a school of thought called network, network theory that we discussed this morning. And uh, the idea being that um, old structures cannot survive this technological revolution. And that mostly it's a good thing. Hierarchies will disappear. All these old structures will be destroyed. And um, the news will be generated in a whole, whole new way. Maybe not tomorrow, but in 100 years from now. Um, and uh, I'm a very quite skeptical of that. One of the pe pieces I asked you to read was something I wrote. <laughs> But it was about my argument against this network theory. But we have those. That's another category of media thinker, media critic. I don't know if you have that parallel here. My sense is you guys don't, haven't gone through the upheaval yet. So you don't have people like that to celebrate it. OK, here's the politically oriented critics. Often. Uh, like this one, uh, this is a guy named Drudge, Matt Drudge. He's actually a person's name. Um, he uh, emerged in the uh, 90s during the Clinton administration, during the uh, Monica Lewinsky scandal. I don't know if you're old enough to remember, but the president had an affair with an intern. And um, Drudge had a very uh, simple-looking um, um, website and he was able somehow to get news, and he was very much right-wing and very much against 
the president. And he was able to get news about this scandal before others and launched himself. And let's see if I can find the Drudge Report. I think it's really interesting because if you look at it, this is what it looks like. You notice how crude it is, right? Um, it's like 90s, right? He hasn't, changed this, he hasn't changed his design since the 90s, and it doesn't matter. He gets millions of hits, millions. He's wildly popular in a certain segment of the thing because he was one saying, look, um, the left, the media is basically a hoax. It's all a, um, a, um, uh, a secret uh, plot to advance the left. I'm going to reveal the truth. And I'm going to reveal all of the right-wing news that you need, including flaws in, in media coverage. And you'll notice, like, there's always um, unflattering uh, photos of the president and and others. But he'll he'll always um, um, he'll always uh, he'll always seize on news that um, if you're a conservative, you'd be happy to see. So that's that's a that's another part of. Um, that's, an, that's another part of our, our media, media criticism landscape. Okay. Uh, there are other, there are other um, and, and, and Drudge, Drudge is um, commercially successful. He's on his own and has made a fortune just by doing the links that I just was showing you. These simple links to stories. Um, Voters heckle McCain over Syria war, but whatever whatever his view on Syria war is, you know that, that he's advancing that. There's a, 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 a conservative view about everything, and and, and he's commercially uh, he's commercially uh, successful. Uh, other other of these sites are are actually funded by oligarchs. Um, something called Freedom Watch. Other others like that. And on the left, there are other cog there are other uh, analogous sites where, um, particularly Media Matters, which is a, a site that that monitors, among other things, Fox News. Fox News is the Murdoch channel that expresses a right wing orientation, and Media Matters is there to criticize it. So that's another piece of our map. And there was this funny. Example, we just had a couple of, we just had a, an example with Drudge, right? So I'm at the Columbia Journalism Review, and we do what we think is unbiased um, criticism based on journalistic criteria. Um, this article was unfair. The article didn't include this context. The article uh, uh, should have interviewed the person mentioned should have included whatever. That's how we go about our business. Or the article got its facts wrong. So one of the things we did, my colleague Ryan Chittam, uh, saw the story about by Huffington Post. The Huffington Post is the left wing site, right? And it um, Huffington Post was. It, was trying to was writing a, a business story that said, um, you know, McDonald's is really unfair to its workers, and it doesn't pay them enough, which is true, but that's not the point. It said it what it did was they said we found a study by the University of Kansas, a major university in the U.S., that that found that if you um, if you double, you could double the wages of of everyone working at McDonald's, and you'd only have to raise the price of a hamburger by 68 cents, a small amount. Um, one um, greenie. And, um, and so this, this Huffington Post story circulated around the world saying, boy, isn't McDonald's cheap? 
And we came across it, Ryan came across it and says, wait a minute, is that right? And first of all, he found out, number one, that the story was not based on, um, was not based on a University of Kansas study. In fact, it was based on a study by a, a, a term paper by an undergraduate, <laughs> undergraduate student, so not even a grad student. Uh, it turns out he had made major errors in his math. Uh, I won't go through it, <laughs> but, but this is what we do. Right, this is what we do. And Ryan um, uh, said, look, you're not adding the right numbers. You're completely wrong. If you really wanted to, um, if you really wanted to, um, uh, if you really wanted to double wages of people working at McDonald's, you'd have to raise the price of food much more than the small amount that Huffington Post said. Okay, so that's what, you know, that was a, we got a lot of, we got some attention for that. Huffington Post, to its credit, here's Huffington Post, afterward, admits it made mistakes. Um, so that's sort of content analysis in, in, you know, very simple form. Huffington Post admits it makes, made mistakes. And, you know, everyone does. No big deal. But Ryan happens to be somewhat familiar with the economics of McDonald's. Why? Because McDonald's has written about quite a bit in the business press. So I, I'm thinking what happened was he came across the original Huffington Post story and read it like, this is a good story. I, I'm going to praise it or something. And then said, so, wait a minute, the math is wrong. In fact, I'm going to write something that's completely the opposite. I'm going to correct this story. Well, uh, because McDonald's is such an important symbol in the U.S. about not just food, but about um, the economy. You know, McDonald's is an important part of our economy because so many people work for it and also within its industry of the fast food. And this is not good news for our economy, obviously. This is not a good thing, but we're all, many of us are concerned that too many people are working in low wage jobs like McDonald's. So it got a lot of attention. So when he saw, well, I think what, what, why he picked the story was he, he saw it, was interested in it as a story and then said, wait, there are errors in it that became even more interesting, but for a completely different reason. Okay. The only other thing I wanted to point out about this piece is that Drudge linked to it. Now, Drudge linked to it, I don't, it's not here anymore. It's gone. But Drudge put it right here, like right here, somewhere like that. Huge error in Huffington Post. And the reason they did it wasn't because they cared about the error in Huffington Post, but they cared about embarrassing the left-wing thing. And the link came to our site. And we got so much traffic, it crashed our our servers. I mean, it was a monster st story for us, only because this guy had linked to it. And the reason he linked to it were entirely political. And I would suggest to you that the reasons he linked to it are completely different from the ones that we had when we, be when we took on the story. Obviously, we didn't care if Huffington Post was a left-wing or a right-wing paper, and we didn't care if the error it made um, made McDonald's look better or worse. Uh, I guess I'm using this example only to say that pure media criticism doesn't care about the politics of anything. It just goes in and tries to sort through the facts and get it right. I mean, I'm not saying we always do, but I'm just saying in the ideal world, that's what you're looking for. Okay. Okay, now I want to get to a couple of uh, pieces of, well, I want to, okay, we're about halfway through. Um, do you guys need a break or something? Wanna, you good? We all right? Okay. Um, uh I want to talk about this, but before I do, I want to talk about ethics. Um, 
and let's face it. Let's look at a certain a case. Okay. Great. In 1983, a Wall Street Journal reporter who wrote a column about about um, stocks. It's fairly well known. They still publish it. It's called Heard on the Street. Heard on the Street was a column in those days about a single stock. And what it was trying to do was heard on the street. It's sort of this kind of you know, sense that this is inf inside information that readers are going to be interested in because it's going to affect the movement of the stock, right? This is all about making money. So, um, and it's a, it was a great column. It's not as good under Mur Murdoch, but that's okay. Um, in one day, so his name was Foster Winans. One day, um, he was approached by a stockbroker, a guy named Peter Brandt, who said, look, I'll pay you. I'm going to pay you in advance for what you're about to write in the paper tomorrow. You just tell me the day before. I'll trade on the stock. Um, and, um, and I'll give you back part of the profits. So... Foster Winans was later discovered and went to prison. Eight months and paid a fine. The case went to the United States Supreme Court. And the issue was the extent, the question was the legal question. Like, you don't have to worry about it, but the legal question was did, did this reporter steal from his employer? Stealing meaning stealing information that was really destined for the public. I can't remember what the court said. I think they said yes. You can't do, this was insider information. Um, I mean, the story is, has a typical American ending. He got rich. He, made a, he wrote a book, and after he got out of jail, I guess he did very well. Um, but, um, but the point is, I guess, I want to make is that um, this was a big scandal that people still remember, and it was 35, 40 years ago. We have a lot of problems in the U.S. media. Trust me. You know, it's not like it's not like we have a lot, to, you know, to brag about. Um, but I would suggest that as the industry matures and as um, um, for instance, let me give you a parallel example. One of the most um, interesting cultures to study from an American point of view is the British culture because the we share the same language but it's a very different culture and in um, and you're all aware of the hacking scandal that Murdoch and there's a more or less right so the hacking scandal is that Murdoch's um, uh, tabloid the news of the world was hiring private investigators to um, you know, hack into someone's voicemail, cell phone voicemail, and get their messages. 
royal family people, uh, celebrities, soccer, uh, football players, and, and of course, uh, innocent people too. And that they were also bribing, bribing the um, police for tips about what was going on with their investigation. So official corruption. Um, and then, and one other thing that they thought was, and, 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 and the, um, the way this whole thing got started was, um, was uh, in 2006, it was long, this has been going on for years. In 2006, um, uh, the News of the World published something about the royal family that only like three people knew. Like Queen Elizabeth and Prince William, Harry, Prince, you know, whatever, and the other, and the, the two dogs, you know. And no one knew about it. And so they, somebody hacked somebody's, you know, somebody's been tapping the phones or something. Something was up. So the police did an investigation. They broke in to a, they got a tip. They broke into a, um, I can't remember. There was a, a, there was a reporter named Clive Goodman, and there was a um, private investigator named Paul Mulher or Mulcair or something. Point is, they broke in and this, this, uh, they, they beat down the door. They, they come in and, and Mulcair has this vast store of records of, you know, all the stuff he's hacked on behalf of Murdoch's paper. And, you know, it was like, um, uh, you know, there are, you know, many, uh, many, there are like many, like, receipts from the paper about, you know, here's 100 pounds for this hack and 100 pounds for bribery. And one of the things that they would do, very common, was to basically they would, they would, um, these private eyes would lie to get information. So, uh, like they would call up, like the hospital, and say, um, and it literally happened in the case of Tony Blair's family, his ch children or something, where they called the hospital and said, this is Mrs. Blair. Okay, so obviously unethical, correct? So what was interesting about this was, um, you know, the, the, the discovery of this trove of material got, like, everyone, whoa, what's going on? Da, da, da. And so um, the uh, Office of Communications, which is a, uh, you know, a, I think it's a cabinet branch of government, uh, did an investigation. And what was just bizarre... I wish I had it in front of me because anyway, I could find it like five minutes, but I don't want to send, spend it looking for it. But what was, what was bizarre was they did this thing. It's like a two, I, I'm going to find it for you because after class because you, you, it'll be interesting to you. They did like a 300-page report, and basically they laid out a chart of, okay, which papers are um, um, hacking, which ones are mis using misrepresentation? Which ones are using all these, doing all these illegal? My point is, it was like basically every paper in Britain, except for a couple. You know, the Guardian was one that didn't pay, and I don't know. But it was like the Times of London, the Telegraph. I mean, Mary Claire magazine, like this women's magazine. Everyone was doing it, like you said, right? Everyone was doing it. And um, um, everyone was, will, and I think everyone will be doing it here until one day they won't. I'm just making that prediction. Like you'll, in five years, something will happen. Someone will do, something will, some, some scandal will, will emerge about something. Maybe one of you will write the story. Yeah, I want you to ask me, but I'm just saying, I want to say that in 10 years, this practice here will be um, rare. Okay. Right. 
Right. Right. Ah. Yeah, I wish I was paid more because that's a very difficult question. Uh, lay out the facts. Tell me. Tell me what the facts are as you understand them. They said, where is the stuff that Snowden gave you, right? Okay. They said to the Guardian, you have to destroy the stuff that, that Snowden gave you. You have to do, right. I think you're getting it right. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> right. And uh, yeah, it's an interesting set of facts, right? So um, let's start with the first one and we can talk about it. I had a whole other section on content analysis, but I'm not sure we're going to get to it. Maybe, maybe yeah, maybe also. But. Um, question is, if someone comes to you from the Secret Service here, or the National Security uh, Apparatus, and has similar things. Um, by the way, um, you know, um, the government or the police have means to um, have, been have been collecting not, you know, every call you make, n not the contents, but the, um, the numbers that you've been calling. And we've been, they've been storing it in the database. I, am, uh, I, am a, I work for the government. I'm meeting you in a cafe wearing a disguise. And here's the, here's the proof. And um, I... It's not an ethical question. I know that I am breaking the law. It's against the it's against the law for me to give for me to give this to you. Question is, is it against the law for you to accept it? You would take it. That's what I'm talking about. So, is that would, would everyone more or less agree with that decision? Yeah, by U.S. standards, it's quite ethical. I don't know. Does, I don't know enough about Ukrainian law, but I assume it's probably illegal for you to accept the document. Do we know? Anyway, the answer to my well, if, it's, uh, if it's considered a secret, I know it's illegal for me to give it to you, but is it illegal for you to accept it? Yeah, it says top secret. It says top secret. Anyone reading this is breaking the law. Is that, um, I don't know if that's true. In the U.S. it's not true. They could say that, but it's not true. You can read it. And you can print it. For instance, a yeah, famous case, the famous case in our country was 1973, um, there was a guy working for the Central Intelligence Agency named Daniel Ellsberg, and he was one of these very bright young people. And the CIA, this was in the late 60s, and the CIA at the time was, was, was trying to figure out what had gone, they were, we were still in Vietnam. Remember that. You're all too young, but I, I'm not. We were still in Vietnam in the late 60s. Things were going terribly wrong. And the CIA commissioned a study, how did we get into this mess? Secret, super secret, hyper secret. And they're called the Pentagon Papers. And they had a team of writers writing about it. One of them was named Daniel Ellsberg. Uh, 
Ellsberg was working on this stuff. And he's, he's basically his, his own product. He's a very brilliant young man. And um, I mean, it was a really, a, it was a bad war. It was really a, you know, and he, see, and a little bit like Snowden, he's reading this and says, this is something that the public needs to see. And he also makes the decision on his own that not only is this something the public needs to see, but it's not going to harm the national interest. It will not harm uh, national security. Now, of course, he's not authorized to make that decision, right? He's just a low-level analyst, like Snowden. I mean, that's Snowden may have been right, but he obviously didn't have the authority to make the decision of what does and does not harm the national interest. For one thing, Snowden and Ellsberg don't know the whole picture, right? They're just in the middle somewhere. Somebody may say, well, there's other things that this can impact that you don't know about. But in any case, Ellsberg um, calls up, uh, uh, I can't remember the reporter's name, but he calls up this guy from the New York Times. And, you know, this is back in the day before, the, obviously, everything, before the Internet, before... I think there was, you know, copy machines was like, were fairly new, you know, even back then. And like they meet in some secret motel in the middle of nowhere. I mean, and they are copying hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages. They put it in the trunk and stuff like that. Uh, the Nixon administration finds out, well, the New York Times, of course, is, prepares this massive story based on these documents. And the Nixon administration um, finds out and goes to court. And not only does it, um, do they want the, um, um, I mean, Ellsberg arrested, of course. But they ask the court to um, stop the New York Times from publishing its story. This is called prior restraint. And, um, and New York Times, I mean, the Supreme Court in, a, in an important decision um, upholds the right of the New York Times to run the story. Um, and um, even, and during, there's an interesting sidelight, but during the delay, while the court's considering, the, the, the Times agrees to wait, which is, you know, right on the edge, right? And while they're waiting, the Washington Post gets its own version. And so now the government has to run to court to stop the Washington Post. And the point is the press sort of cooperates in a way to get these things. I guess the point here is that, um, is that um, um, no one suggested that it was any way unethical or illegal for the reporters to receive the documents. It's never really been suggested. Uh, that's basically true also. I mean, some people will say that The Guardian and Glenn Greenwald, the journalist, you may have heard of him. He was the reporter who broke this story. He starts a, started it out as a blogger. Uh, that they did something wrong in accepting this document from Snowden. You know, that their, their story was, of course, they, you know, Snowden's in Hong Kong. And he leaves the thing. He downloads whatever he's got. And they all fly secretly to Hong Kong. They meet, you know, whatever. There's a code system. Um, but everyone knows it's really Snowden whose life is on the line, whose fu freedom is in jeopardy. But no one ever suggested that, um, that Greenwald was too. And the Guardian uh, also, you know, I guess it, there was some, some tension about whether the Guardian or or this reporter, we're going to get into trouble. But that was uh, not considered an ethical breach. In fact, it's considered to be very meritorious conduct by the, by the journalist. And your question was, your question was, um, did the Guardian do something wrong by giving the um, documents to the New York Times? Uh, and the, que the answer is actually... Um, it depends, because um, uh, 
newspapers are um, you know, supposed to be independent of government, independent of the whole government apparatus, but we also are supposed to obey the law. You know, unless, except in extreme, extreme cases where we ignore um, court orders and things like that. I mean, it has to be absolutely imperative that we run something. Most of the time, news organizations obey the law. And uh, if, for instance, the, a court had ordered the Guardian to destroy those documents and not to give them to someone else, and they still went ahead and did it, then you could argue that um, that certainly was illegal, because it's a, in, and, and it might even also be unethical. In this case, I think they gave the documents to, to the Times before uh, the police asked them not to. So in that case, I think they were more than fine, more than fine. Okay, anyway, this, this is the, uh, this is the, um, um, that's the, um, this, what I call, what we've been talking about is what I call one of the, oops, sorry, one of the core functions of uh, whatever that is. One of, one of the core functions of um, press criticism is, is ethical concerns. And um, I would suggest to you that, uh, um, um, you know, obviously, it's sort of a prerequisite for, um, uh, it's a, some, almost a foundational topic for, uh, um, for um, all media, and everyone's going to have to grapple with it, <coughs> grapple with these issues. And I would suggest, like, as I told you before, I just want to show you one more thing. I would suggest, as I told you before, that um, what, what everyone does today will not be the practice in 10 years. It, 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 it won't because people like yourselves will essentially eventually move into positions of power and authority. And you'll, um, you'll recognize that the short-term gain uh, profit made by accepting money from a, a subject actually does incredible long-term damage to the value of your own enterprise. And that you'll see that there's value, of course, and becoming known is the one that doesn't do that. And once you do that, once, once one paper does that, um, it will, I, I suspect it will drive out the practice. And in fact, like I said, in ten, five, ten years ago, uh, Britain's culture, while it's not perfect today, was basically lawless back then. And, you know, yes, it took government inquiries, yeah, it took police probes, yes, it took all sorts of investigations, but the important thing to remember, um, from your point of view, I think, is that um, one of the reasons that press culture in the UK is much cleaner than it used to be is basically because of the press itself. Um, the Guardian, which is one of my favorite papers these days, and Alan Rusbridger is the editor, and he's probably, in, in our, at least in the English-speaking English world, considered probably the editor of his generation. Because he's come up with so many amazing stories. One of the things he helped lead them was on the um, News Corp hacking scandal, which was basically uncovered by The Guardian. So you say, well, everyone does it, right? Well, one of these days, one paper is going to decide that it's going to distinguish itself by cleaning up the rest of, by cleaning up the rest of, of the industry, or at least differentiating itself from, from this particular practice. And I suggest that they're going to do very well in the long run. Um, last bit, guys. Stick with me. I just want to talk about this real briefly. Because um, 
Um, this was my thing. <coughs> um, content analysis is, uh, I think, pretty is an important subject because what what it, what it does is um, it's it's one of the few times when someone steps back from the flow of information and looks at a particular subject and tries to say, okay, what was the public actually presented with? What was the what were the stories that they actually read or was available for them to read to understand about something? Whether it's um, you know, I don't know what for instance, uh, help me name a important news event here, maybe a scandal. Was there one re recently? Yeah, big news event here. The, war, uh, the trade war between Ukraine and Russia. Perfect. So, and that occurred, occurring now, going on now. Okay. So, um, it would be interesting, I, I would say, I suggest to you, it would be interesting if, for a critic to gather, you know, all of the significant stories about this particular discrete topic and figure out, like, okay, what, what did we, you know, what, it, what, what, did, what was the public exposed to? What did we, what, you know, where, are the, where were the sources? Who were the sources that were used? What was the essential message? Did maybe put them into categories. Uh, was this uh, pro-Russian, pro-Ukrainian? Was it, uh, did it have, uh, did, it did it look, did it rely on uh, government sources? Did it have opposition sources? Whatever. But, but point out like exactly what the public was exposed to. And because uh, only that, that's the only way you can really figure out whether or not you're you know, you're doing, you know, whether the press as a whole is doing a good job. You could either do it from, for one paper, but it's m often more interesting to do it for a lot, so you can kind of compare them. And, and the reason, one of the reasons I'm here today, I think, is that I got, became known for a piece um, I did about Wall Street reporting before the financial crisis, right? Everyone was saying, well, what happened before the financial crisis? Why were, what, what was the, what were we told about Wall Street and the banking system? So, um, I, we put together this database, um, and we put them into categories. I'm going to just be really brief about this because it's late and we're running out of time. But you'll see on the left, we basically there's 700 stories here. And what I did was I said, okay, well, the question was this. What was the problematic, as, as academics call it? What was the issue? The issue was... Um, why was everyone so surprised when Lehman Brothers declared bankruptcy and the whole financial system appeared on the brink of collapse on September 15, 2008? And there was an argument going on at the time. And the argument was between people like me who said, you know, this was a press failure. Um, you guys did not write stories that um, really reflected what was going on in the financial system. You, 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 you gave us all those glossy stories that, of the kind I was talking about yesterday that glorified these guys, and even though they, you, you know, that when, when you, and you missed the big story. And others on, in, the, in, in my profession, in the business news profession, defended themselves, as, they, as you might expect. They said, Diana Henriquez used, was a teacher here. Does, do you remember her? So we've been, um, we're going to hear about that. But we and we're, we're not um, 
um, uh, enemies, but we are definitely on different sides of this question. And we've had vigorous discussions about this. But she said in a speech right after the crash, the government, the financial industry, and the American consumer, if they had only paid attention, would have gotten ample warning about this crisis from us years in advance when there was still time to evacuate and seek shelter from the storm in November 2008. Another defender. But anybody who's been paying attention has seen business. Anyone who's been paying attention. If you're not paying attention, right? Has, been ser has seen business journalists waving the red flag for several years. Obviously, red flag means warning, right? A guy I used to work for, Nick Diogan. I'm kind of curious as to why it is it that people were shocked given the volume of coverage. And I said, that does not sound right. You know. And so... I felt so strongly about it that I um, I started to look, and I'm just suggesting to you, and I'm going to tell you how I what I what I did here. I'm suggesting to you that um, what I did was um, I said this is was. This is what I, I learned later learned was called content analysis. I said, well, I'm going to search, because we can use computers now and databases. There's a program called Factiva. I don't know what you use to retrieve old news stories electronically. You have something, right? If you want to look up something that was written in the past. S Say, for instance, you wrote something three months ago, and you want to look it up. It, archive. It, but isn't there anything for the whole? Oh, really? OK. All right. So uh, no, no. Because there are, um, there are companies. Because Google is like, hit and miss. You don't know what you're going to get. There are companies that that um, buy the final version of print or online, but usually print, of a, a news story, put it in a database, and it's searchable. So maybe 100, 300, 400 papers are all searchable via this database. Now, there's still a lot of it's not a beautiful, perfect system. It's technolo technological problems, but you can search. So I searched. And so we searched for, and I, you know, the, the, the methodology is, is available, which I'll show it to you, but we were searching for, okay, you know, you say all these warnings, let's, let me go and find, I'll see if I can find them, you know. And that's what, that was the problematic that I started out with, and that was, um, and that's what led me to, and, and I came up with a list of stories that, um, and, and I coded them. And I said, well, there are some things in here that can be fairly called a real warning about what was going on in the financial system. Now, I, defi I defined what, what a warning was, but I thought I was pretty, I explained how I defined it, and I thought I was pretty generous in my definition. And I, and I, and I included them, each one into this database. And each one of those is red. But you'll see that... Um, Obviously, there's not much red here. And, and, but I wanted to be sure that I saw all of their st the stories that really did investigate Wall Street and banks. But of course, I came across other things that were really useful, good stories. But they really didn't count as actual warnings about what was going on in the financial system. I just included them and categorized them. You know, Anyway, the categories were... Um, stories that warned about problems in the 
in the global financial system. Those were useful. I gave that, um, uh, I can't remember what color it was. Then there was a, a set of stories that said, hey, mortga the mortgages that they're selling now are really not very good. They're defective. You should be very careful in buying a mortgage. I called those consumer stories. I put them green. I, didn't call, I don't say those were warnings about the big problems of the thing, but I did that. And then um, there were stories about uh, there were stories about uh, um, uh, housing prices. Like housing prices are really high. Watch out. You know, don't buy a house now or sell your house now or something. And I said, those were useful too, but they really weren't warnings about, about corruption in the financial system, which was really the issue. Anyway, I put them all into this database and was able to write this story and this book that I spoke about yesterday, feels like a long time ago, um, based on confidence, knowledge that I had that I had really checked. I had really done a content analysis of nine publications, Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Fortune, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Bloomberg, and something else. That I had done a, fair, a thorough search, analysis of, and, and, and fair categorization of nine publications on one discrete issue, like trade war, Wall Street reporting, whatever it happened to be. So I would suggest to you that, um, that that's a very uh, labor-intensive task. But I'd also say that um, um, it's one of the two most important areas, I guess, of media criticism. Is one is you know making sure as if you ever become critics or become media reporters, you know, making sure that everything's more or less on the level and that things are people are behaving ethically. That's one important category. And two is to kind of make sure that you can step back and see. On behalf of readers, what um, what the public is exposed to, what what the press is doing, and whether the press is actually doing its job. That's it for today, guys. And I think we're we're basically done. Thanks so much for uh, for your attention. It was great great talking to you.